March 19, 2013, uh, Parks and Recreation Board meeting. Hello, everybody. Hello. You're staying Hello. warm. Uh, first order of business is a roll call, Mary. Uh, Chairman Wolfman? Here. Uh, Member Brush? Skeeto? Here. Dan Jessica? Here. Scott Shabby? Here. Lawrence Rowley? Here. Scoo Walker? Here. Daniel Saffron? Chairman, we have a quorum. Thanks, Mary. Next item is approval of the minutes from our February 19th board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? I'd move to approve the February 19th minutes as proposed. Thank you. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes are approved. Uh, second item is related to the social gathering we had on March 6th. I'd like to once again thank Steve Hill for opening your home to us. It was a, it was a great get together. Uh, for the record, we do need to acknowledge who was in attendance, and I will also note that there was no official park business discussed at the meeting. It was purely a social event. Uh, but at the get-together, uh, I was there, Steve Hill, Dan Jessica, Lauren Torelli, Scoo Walker, and Daniel Safran from the Park Board, city staff, Mary Van Arsdale, Sally Swarthout, Chuck Myers, Jeff Waite, uh, along with our alderman, Randy Tack, were in attendance. Trish, is that all you need? All right, thank you. Uh, next item, uh, we'll have a presentation from Craig Culp, who's the Executive Director of the North Northern Suburban Special Recreation Association, but I believe, Mary, you wanna make a couple opening comments, first of all? Yes, thank you um, very much. We're fortunate to have Craig join us tonight from NSSRA. Um, I know that we provided a, an extensive packet of information for the park board members to take a look at. Um, important to note that we're not asking for any action tonight. Um, it's really the stepping stone to an informational um, uh, uh, progress that we want to make as far as uh, bringing you along with um, some items that are on the horizon that are very significant and hopefully exciting for NSSRA um, and something that the Board of Directors, which I serve on, um, is been working on for a number of years now. And uh, it's, it is something that we are very excited about because we feel that, um, you know, NSSRA has outgrown its current uh, facility that it has and that um, in order to continue to deliver the quality of services that we want, um, you know, this is something that's very important to accomplish for the organization. So um, Craig's going to walk you through tonight a, a PowerPoint presentation to give you and hopefully those at home a little bit of background on NSS Array as well as the efforts that have been put in thus far. Um, and I did want to mention that, um, you know, again, there I do serve on the board of directors for the organization, um, currently chairman. But prior to being chairman of the board, um, I was the original uh, committee chair for starting the look at facility options for um, NSSRA. And um, that, and Craig's going to kind of take you back through some of the history of that. But it's been about a four year effort. But um, I just did it really for the first year, kind of started the discussion. And since then, there's been a special task force involved of other. Um, partner uh, board members that have been involved in it that have tremendous background, whether it's in finance, um, Steve Wilson, for example, who is the executive director of the Wilmette Park District, is on that committee, uh, Ron Skalski, who is with the Lake Bluff Park District, um, I'm sure George from Northfield. So Deerfield and Glencoe. So again, it's very been very uh, much a uh, hands-on, uh, very um, frequent meeting, you know, group that's met pretty frequently to kind of work through a lot of the information that you have here tonight. So anyway, um, I'm going to let Craig take it over and walk you through his presentation. So thank you to the Recreation Board for having me out uh, again today. I was uh, last out to visit with you on September 11th of last year, uh, where you had a couple of families come up. And, uh, and uh, as I was telling Steve, they do a much better job of explaining what we do and how we do what we do. Um, and I know tonight's focus is on our capital and facility plan that we've been working on for a number of years um, and just wanted to thank you for your time uh, this evening and I hope it won't take too much time but we do have a good amount of information that was in your packet and I'd like to you know, provide a, a, a quick review for it. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Is that okay right there? Okay. How's that? Is that better? Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Um, so I'll go through the presentation. Hopefully I'll be able to answer many of the questions that you may have um, going through the presentation, but we most certainly will have time for questions 
as many as you have uh, afterwards. So we get started. Um, who is NSSRA? Just a quick uh, brief review or overview. Um, we are a governmental association of the 13 park districts and rec departments of the North Shore. So our northern border is Lake Bluff and our southern border is Wilmette and Glenview and basically everything on the North Shore in between. Our western border is Riverwoods and then our western border just kind of runs down Lake Bluff, Lake Forest, Riverwoods, Deerfield, Northbrook, around to Glenview and in, into Wilmette. So there's our 13 partners there. Um, kind of a, a, an interesting and something that we're very proud of. Uh, NSSRA is the first ever SRA in the world, uh, created in 1970, um, and now Illinois is the only state that has SRAs, and now we have 33 SRAs in Illinois serving 246 communities, I believe. Don't quote me exactly on that. So um, it all started right here on the North Shore. So our mission is to enrich the lives of people with disabilities and our partner communities through quality recreation. Um, and when I'm talking to our residents, uh, what I would say uh, and what our mission is, is we're an extension of the park districts and rec departments of the North Shore. It just specifically, we're a park district for individuals with disabilities. Um, so our program guide, which is, in right, which is right in front of you, you know, if you look at that uh, in comparison to Lake Forest rec departments or any one of our partner Deerfield Park Districts program guide, very similar um, in, in what we do. Just specifically, we, specifically, we do it for folks with disabilities. Um, our services, as I was mentioning, um, to put it simply, uh, we provide uh, a, a number of programs and we kind of divide them up into a couple of categories. Our traditional programs are mostly what you see there in the program guide, from our after school programs to our sports teams to our cultural arts programs to our theaters, etc. cetera. Um, inclusive opportunities, one of the greatest um, strengths of NSSRA or any SRA um, is the philosophy to include all participants in any of their recreational needs. And we work with our partner agency staff to assess any, part, any participant's needs in a home park district or home rec department program and provide any accommodation. And we've been doing that for years. Um, it, the ADA came into, be, uh, came into being in the early 90s. Philosophically, NSSRA was already providing those services prior to that happening. So uh, those are our inclusion services. And then um, our cooperative uh, programs are when we partner with another agency or organization in our partner agencies' uh, communities to provide some type of recreational program for their residents or their individuals. Um, in addition to our programs, we work hand in hand with all of our partner agency staff um, as a resource and a partner in making sure that everybody's recreational needs are met. Um, and then lastly, um, kind of along the lines of inclusion, um, being that resource, uh, our most common accommodation when, a, when an individual needs an accommodation is to provide a one-on-one -on -one inclusion aid in a program. So for example, if the assessment uh, says that this is what's necessary, we'll hire a one-on-one -on -one individual to go through summer camp with a participant with a disability to make sure that his or her experience in that program, whether it's summer camp or baseball or skating or uh, or anything that we offer in any of our partner districts, it's our responsibility to assess that and provide that accommodation. Um, and that goes right back to the ADA, um, you know, any reasonable accommodation. Um, and that's a gigantic program for us. Um, and we do it all throughout the year in all 13 of our, of our partner uh, agencies. Um, now, kind of shifting gears from our overall what we do specifically to our um, capital and facility acquisition plan, just a little bit of background which Mary touched on. Um, we started in, in 2010 um, with a conditions, uh, existing conditions and space needs analysis. And actually uh, we started a little bit before that. When I was hired, that was one of the items that the board brought to me um, as a directive to assess and take a look at you know, the facility needs of the agency. Um, so, we brought in Williams Architects in 2010 to take a look at that, and that, it, uh, that study is mentioned very much in our plan. Um, and then in, at the end of 2010 through the beginning of 2011, uh, the staff and board went through a strategic planning process, and our strategic plan for 2011 through 2014 was, was approved in the spring of 2011. Um, and specifically what we're talking about this evening is our strategic initiative to review and finalize our facility plan. Um, within that initiative, we have a specific strategic goal, which is to secure the most suitable permanent location for NSSRA with a partner agency. 
um, and Kurt had put out a uh, had had voiced a question. When we say with a partner agency, that's very str strategic and specific. Um, the work that we have done as a board and an agency, um, we have focused in on the goal to, for efficiency's sake, and to ensure that we're in a recreational setting, that it's best for us to be patient and wait until a good opportunity with one of our 13 partners opens up to create or house a new home for NSSRA. Um, and that we put a lot of time and effort into and a lot of deliberation, but we thought it very important that that's a goal that we definitely shoot for to ensure that um, for efficiency's sake and to make sure that we're in a recreation setting, and we'll talk about where we presently are now, um, that that is very important. Um, secondly, the plan that we have in front of you, uh, because of that goal to be patient until we have an opportunity with a partner, we had to do a lot of research and we had to make some assumptions to put numbers on paper. Um, so as you're looking at the plan or as you have looked at the plan, um, please take into account that uh, we had to make some projections um, with real world numbers today, um, but throughout this entire plan, this, this plan takes into account a goal of actually acquiring a facility or moving in um, in 2018, so about four and a half to five years from now. Um, and that is by no, by no means etched in stone. It could be earlier than that. It could be much longer than that. But our board and our staff is committed to waiting to do this one more time so we have a permanent home for NSSRA. Um, and in doing our research, uh, the plan also shows that it's, it's, it's most sensible for us, uh, business-wise, financially, to start um, planning for and funding a capital plan uh, in our next fiscal year, which is 2014. And our fiscal year is a calendar year, and that's why we're here today uh, to present this to you. Um, key points on the facility acquisition. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, we want to uh, locate with one of our 13 partner agencies. Um, and obviously, our goal is to address the substantial needs that we're lacking in our present um, facility. And uh, they include uh, private meeting space, and this is really one of the main cruxes of it all. Um, in our facility, we do not have a, a single um, doored conference or meeting room where families who either move to NSSRA's district or are having some issues with the participant um, that we serve and we need to talk about things, we do not have a private meeting room to sit down with those families and have a discussion, and I have some photos of that. So, um, uh, so space-wise, when it comes to meeting, we have safety issues with our location and the setup of our, um, our uh, parking area, um, adequate space to conduct all of our business, whether it's meeting. Uh, we have no programming space there at all. Um, our office space is, is uh, truly at capacity or, or over capacity. Um, and we have no room uh, to train any of our staff. Uh, well, we can train up to 25 staff in our one meeting room. Um, and this past year, in 2012, we issued 540 W-2s. So we have quite a large staff. Um, and we have an extensive training program, which we farm out to our partner agencies to use their facilities for that training. Um, also, it's very important that we continue our model of having uh, the vast majority of our programming in our partner agency um, facilities. Um, this, this facility plan, do, it does have a small uh, area set aside for programming space, but it's multi-purpose space. Um, but we do not want to create a recreation center. We want to create a home for NSSRA that has, you know, 3,500 square feet of multi-use programming and training space. Um, but we do not want to disrupt the model of using all of our partner facilities because the resources our partnership has in 13 communities is unbelievable, second to none. Um, and lastly, uh, the board and staff realizes that this is a plan and it is absolutely essential for us to review um, different opportunities as they come up um, and on an annual basis update this plan so that we're staying current. I'll get into um, the present building that we're at and its, its deficiencies. Uh, we're presently located in Northbrook in the Sky Harbor Industrial Park. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, one of our main concerns is that we have no private meeting space for families and staff to interact. Um, on many, many levels, that just is something that needs to be addressed, um, and it's, we're not able to do that in our facility as it currently stands. Um, 
unsafe location in an industrial park. If you're familiar with Sky Harbor, it is an industrial park. Our next door neighbor is an electrical contractor that does electricity for major hospitals. FedEx is right behind us. Across the street is Mark Vending. The most common traffic that we see are 18 wheelers that are coming to make deliveries to the industrial park. Um, so uh, it is an unsafe location. Um, and where, it's, where we have the biggest safety concern is in our parking lot. Our participants, when they're dropped off to be picked, you know, to take our vans to our programs, they have to cross the traffic in the parking lot. In every recreation center or school, you'll see there's either a half turn or a secluded parking lot where participants can be dropped off and then secured by staff. Um, we don't have that ability. No matter what, getting out of a car, you have to cross some type of traffic, though it's in a parking lot, but still with our population, you know, that concern is tremendous. Craig, can um, I just add one comment to yes. that too? And um, you know, with that, the parking lot, the parking lot takes up their entire exterior space as well. They have no green space around their building for activity or outdoor, uh, you know, participants to sit if they're, you know, really um, going to have like a small group exercise as well. They yeah. truly are a building surrounded by a drive and a parking lot. <laughs> right. That's what they have. So and zone-wise, just uh, um, I don't know how into the weeds we want to get. Uh, but zoning wise we're not allowed to offer any recreational programming in our building so if we have a, a a deck of uno cards we can't go downstairs in our conference room and actually play a game of uno and um, it's because of some neighbors down the road many years ago wanted to start a church et cetera, et cetera. they had kids running around the city approached them and said this is zoned for industrial we can have no recreation it's not zoned for this and when i started it was made very clear to me by the um, you know that those rules are in place and they're in place for a very specific reason um, and as a recreation agency you know do not run programs and we don't have the space number one number two it's not we're not legally allowed to run programs there um, we're not accessible uh, by the new ADA rules and even the old ADA rules when we purchased when NSSRA purchased the building in 2000 um, some variances were grandfathered in Right now, with the new ADA rules that went into place, um, our building in many, many ways is not accessible at all. And again, in our business, that's not sending the right message. That needs to be addressed. Um, lack of training and meeting space. Um, we have one meeting room in, in the building. It can seat you know, comfortably 15 people, packed you know, really uncomfortably, maybe 27, 28. Um, so really that's the extent of our meeting space. Um, we have no programming space, which we, are, which we already talked about. Um, office space, we are truly bursting at the seams. You know, we, have, uh, um, we have two staff that share one office, and that office is uh, 83 square feet you know, for two full-time staff. So when it comes to having discussions with families about very sensitive items, you know, a phone conversation cannot be private, even with the door closed, because there very possibly will be another workmate right there. Um, and during the summertime, when we're at full staff, um, we're absolutely teaming. It lends to a lot of teamwork and, and uh, you know, a family approach, um, but uh, some additional space is definitely necessary. Uh, we have one storage room, which I have a picture I'll show you in a moment. You know, and again, an agency that has 500 plus staff uh, and, and serves eight, you know, over 7,000 registrations a year. We have, just like all of our partners, a, a lot of storage uh, needs for our summer camp equipment, um, adapted equipment, et cetera. Um, we spend over $4,000 a year on off-site storage right now because uh, we don't have any storage in our present room, our present facility. Uh, no room for fu future growth. That's pertaining to any staff growth um, and pending capital improvements. One exercise that the board and staff went through with Williams, Exer with Williams Architects is we did an existing condition study. Um, and on a very conservative side, uh, uh, the architect said that we have over $400,000 in capital improvements that are coming down the pike. Um, if you really stretch it out, doing category one, two, and three, which are on all levels, um, it's nearly a million dollars that they documented um, in capital improvements coming in the future. Um, here are a couple of pictures. It's a little bit dark. Um, and again, in, a, in, in an industrial area, um, our total square foot, uh, we have 8,300 square feet. Uh, 4,000 on grade, 4,000 square feet under grade. It's an exact um, footprint above ground and underground. Um, here's our back, and if you, uh, so as Mary said, there's our building. We have a driveway that comes up. It's parking where this picture is being taken from. Um, that's the only green, 
you know, grass that we have right there that's covered with snow. And you can see across the street, those are industrial uh, buildings and actually their backyard is 294. The toll booth is literally right behind Mark Vending right there. So uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, background, background as, as to exactly where we're located. This is the conference room I was telling you about. This is our one and only meeting or conference room. Um, and if you count the chairs there, the table can sit 16 people. Um, and then with people around the outside, we can get you know, above that. But in the back left-hand corner there, we have three staff offices because we're so crowded that that's not a doored space and their only access is through the conference room. So when we have meetings, whether it's board meeting or a meeting with the family, we have signs at the top of the stairs um, that say a meeting is in progress to um, encourage those folks that are in the, those offices not to go down because a private meeting is, um, is underway. And when we have meetings, we'll give them the out, we'll ask them either close your door and, and know you're gonna be in there for a half hour to 45 minutes, or go on upstairs, you can go into my office or whoever's conducting the meeting, use their desk in the meantime, et cetera. Um, and there's our one and only storage room. It's literally a closet um, saying that that's in, in our basement and you can see it's packed to the top with balls and yoga mats and hula hoops, et cetera. So, um, Getting into our space needs analysis. So that's a little background on where we are in Northbrook right now. Um, working with uh, Williams Architects, uh, the space needs analysis resulted in a target of 15,000 square feet for a new facility. Our current facility, as I said, has 8,300 square feet. And just a real simple breakdown of how that 15,000 square feet is broken down. Offices, approximately 4,000 square feet. Programming and training space um, for our staff and multi-purpose use would be 3,300 square feet. Um, meeting and conference would be 30, also 3,300 square feet. And then common area, storage, lobby, washrooms, et cetera, um, would be 4,350 square feet to get to that target of about 15,000 square feet. Um, and accessories capital component. Um, we're a unique agency because we are an extension of our 13 park districts. So our capital needs are, if you looked in, uh, uh, in, in looking at the plan on page number eight, um, are not that tremendous. Um, and when I say that, um, we have vehicles, which is, uh, we have nine uh, vehicles that we use to transport our participants to and from programs throughout all 13 of our communities that are owned by our agency and driven by our staff. Uh, Technology-wise, that's our computers, servers, et cetera. Um, and again, having a staff of 20 full-time staff and 520 part-time staff, you know, technology is an important um, uh, part of what we do, but we're small. You know, we have 20 workstations or just over 20 workstations when, when we're working in the summertime. Um, and then our facilities. So uh, the really great news is the vehicles that we have, if you look in the capital plan, over the next 10 years, uh, those vehicle costs are, are estimated at about $550,000. The really great news is that our foundation, NSSRF, the Northern Suburban Special Rec Foundation, made a commitment a year and a half ago to fund our vehicle needs for the next 10 years. So that $550,000 is in our capital plan, um, but the foundation bought our first van for us last year. We have another van that's coming on order for this year, and our 10-year plan of $550,000 for our vehicles is taken on. Um, solely and exclusively by our foundation. We're so thankful for that. Um, Technology-wise, uh, it, it, if you look at our 10-year, according to our technology plan, we have $138,000 uh, in our capital plan for technology over the next 10 years. So, you know, under $14,000 a year. And then facility, and this is one of the reasons why this uh, plan is titled a capital and facility acquisition plan. Because um, when you really do the numbers, um, and the vehicles being taken care of by our foundation. Um, this is a facility plan because it is the, the, the biggest part of this plan by a landslide. Um, and you know, our projections here are just under $4 million for um, our facility needs over the, um, you know, the next number of years. Um, estimated cost, oops, I went backwards. Estimated cost of our new facility. And again, going backwards for just a second, um, when our facility committee and staff worked on this, um, again, assuming a, an event horizon or an acquisition in 2018 so that, we, so that we can put numbers on paper, 
um, that's what we're, what, what we're uh, using here. So total costs for a new facility are estimated at $3.85 million. And that's made up of two main components, which um, is construction of a new facility. And it may be renovation, but for to be as conservative as possible and to estimate high and hope we come in lower, um, 15,000 square feet at $250 a square foot in new construction as the going rate right now um, is where we decided to, to stick. And we worked with Williams Architects to, to get that figure. In addition to that, we put in $100,000 of land acquisition. Depending on which partner we're able to work with and how that entire transaction and or final facility comes to be, whether it's renovation or acquisition of new land, a new building, et cetera, um, we put in $100,000 of land acquisition costs um, with the thought of having approximately an 8,000 square foot footprint um, and figuring that a, an acre of land in the North Shore area averages around $300,000 an acre. Doing the math, that comes, around, that comes out to be between $55,000 and $60,000. And then with a partner, if we have shared space that we're using, whether it's parking or other rooms that are in the facility, and um, we're charged for some land acquisition there, we kept an additional forty dollars to $45,000 to bring it to an even $100,000 just to be conservative. Because we, we want to make sure that we're doing the, our best job of accounting for the expenses that may come our way so that we're projecting accurately. Um, in 2018, we're hoping to have a down payment of $1.5 million, and I'll talk about where that comes from in a moment, um, with uh, a remaining balance of $2.3 million to be financed over the, the final 21 years of this 25-year plan. And when we figured the financing, uh, Steve Wilson from Wilmette was very instrumental in this. You know, he said, again, conservatively speaking, um, $2.3 million at 3.5% over those 21 years is detailed on page number eight, and there's a different shading there to show you in 2018 where that actually occurs. Um, now, the down payment is something that we worked on, um, and the $1.5 million down payment uh, comes from three sources. Uh, first, the sale of our existing building, which I'll talk on further in a moment, because it is a, uh, it, it's a strategy and, and, and a good plan, and, but with our fingers crossed when it comes to selling anything in this economy. $800,000 from NSSRA's fund balance and capital fund. Um, and very specifically, that's approximately $500,000 from the capital plan as it sits here, accumulating funds between 2014 and 2018 to defer any, any costs and, and use as a down payment, plus taking approximately $300,000 from the agency's fund balance, which will keep us in line with our fund balance policy still. Um, so the good work we've done over the last number of years to build our fund balance um, we're hoping to use that to defer some interest costs in the future. And we have a commitment from a family for a quarter of a million dollars towards our new facility, um, which is great, um, and we're, we're excited about that. And then lastly, our funding formula um, is we are uh, projecting to ask to receive 80% of our cost for this plan from our 13 partner agencies, which uh, is just over $3 million and 20% from outside sources, which would include our foundation, our users, uh, different families and donors to our association. Um, and we're excited, we have sat down with our foundation, we've, met a pre we've made a presentation uh, uh, in draft form of this, um, and they're very supportive of the direction that we're going in um, as a whole and, and have, uh, have yet to sign on the dotted line that they're making a commitment, but have verbally said that they're very much on board. Uh, but want to let this process go th through with all of our partners. And I, and I have to say that um, the foundation uh, was recognized at the Illinois Park and Rec Association Conference for a couple years ago as the outstanding foundation in the state. Uh, they have raised over a million dollars um, in the recent years and have a very, very committed board and a very passionate family base um, that I think will be significant and strong advocates for assisting with that side of the component for definitely for they're, the they're very much on board um, and it's a pleasure to work with them to say the least um, Mary and I were working on this and this specifically relates to the Lake Forest uh, special rec levy um, and NSSRA is a cooperative agency um, and we have no ability to levy any taxes so I'll let Mary, because if I were to speak on this, um, I might not be 100% accurate. So 
Mary will speak on uh, specifically Lake Forest Levy. Okay, um, and so just to kind of give you a little backdrop on this, um, uh, beginning in 2005, the city um, opted to uh, uh, exercise their ability to um, issue a levy called the Special Recreation Tax Levy. So on an annual basis, we levy dollars for the purpose to assist us with needs uh, to support um, ADA or you know disabled services in our community related to recreation. And so um, I, what I did here was I just pulled a snapshot of 2012 up so you can get a sense, because this is kind of this um, typical of what we spend our dollars on and how it works. And the first thing is what's called our MAC, or Member Agency Contribution. So in 2012, as an example, um, we contributed $209,382 to the necessary organization. And what that is is all the partners uh, do this member agency com uh, contribution. It's based on a formula between um, your population and your EAV. So it's all calculated. Um, formulatic between you know the size of your community and your EAV. And so that's how we come up with what our MAC contribution will be. And this goes to providing the administrative uh, funding and oversight, organizational support that they need to run the operations and all their personnel and the, the expenses that you're seeing that are not um, related specifically to the program expense. And so participants, um, though we pay the 209, participants are still paying for program fees, and they're still you know, using that to offset expenses that, like program supplies and busing or transportation. So the 209,000 here is strictly towards the administrative overhead of the entire organization. Um, and then what we use our levy for is um, items that we have specifically in our community that we can show directly benefits our service to individuals with disabilities. So in 2012, as an example, we used $60,000 of our levy money to help fund a portion of the cost related to Townline Community Park and the Waveland Park Playground. So we look at our projects and say, are there elements in here that we can specifically say will ensure and enhance the ability for people with uh, disabilities to participate? And you might recall that Townline and Waveland, we chose to do port and play surfacing as an example. Um, we did the equipment so that there was um, transfer platforms so they could um, you know, get up on equipment and enjoy it. And then we have certain ground elements versus raised elements and those kind of considerations. We can't fund an entire playground um, with ADA or special rec levy unless we can show that it's a fully accessible, every element of it is accessible. So that's why you only see a portion of it. So we've been doing that since we started levying our money um, for things like playgrounds or other needs we have in our department that you know, happen. So it varies every year. The, it might be a playground, it might be um, something at the recreation center that we want to, um, you know, change or do differently. So it does, does that dollar amount does go up and down. Um, and then we are, um, we do put a portion of salary, staff salaries, especially Sally in my time, um, with our work related to ADA um, as well as NSSRA. So all of the things we do to coordinate all the inclusion staff that work with the program participants, because par participants sign up through our programs, they submit a form that says I need to be, uh, I need assistance. We have to coordinate that with Craig's staff, come in, get the assessment done, you know, match the families together with the staff and those kinds of things. So there's a great deal of time involved with that, plus our service in participating in superintendent meetings and, and my, my service as a chairman on the, on the board or as a board member. Um, and again, that number can vary, you know, we don't, depending what's on the platform, you know, what's on our docket, I could put more in or not. So this number has gone up recently when I became chairman of the board because I do spend a, a significant amount of my time um, assisting Craig or attending events and, and doing business on, relate, on behalf of NSSRA. Um, and then the next item is our inclusion cost. That is strictly what NSSRA bills us that we can show there was a staff member placed right with a participant in our programs here in Lake Forest in order to make that um, participation happen. And so that's a direct salary line item um, bill that we receive and we, we pay back to NSSRA. And then the last thing is School District 67 um, does charge fees for use of the space because NSSRA though or they're part of us are, do, do not meet their definition of allowing them to have free space. Um, and so we do um, 
get a charge for any time we run an NSS array program in the school district using their space since we don't have it maybe at the rec center and that averages around five thousand dollars a year so there you can see um, for 2012 around three hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars but as you look at the levy we love a levy a year ahead so you look at 2012 for what we can spend 2011 I'm sorry for what we spend in 12 we had around three hundred fifty one thousand dollars levied that is um, that's the difference that we have potentially to help us fund what we might contribute towards this facility acquisition plan without necessarily having to change our levy amount. But anything we don't spend stays in this levy fund. It can't be used, you know, on other been, you know, other expenses in the park and rec budget. It just continues to build in this fund if we don't spend it. Um, so we do have on our plate coming forward is not only do we have um, what we want to do as far as um, funding the facility acquisition capital expense on an annual basis, but we also did our ADA audit. We mentioned recently we're in the middle of developing a transition plan. Between those two, depending on how we determine the final projects for complying with ADA on the, all the city services as well as this capital plan, we may or may not be able to use the existing levy. It may, you know, may have to be increased. We, that's what we're still researching. We don't know that just yet. But if we weren't to have the transition plan component in here, we do feel that we have enough money just to do the acquisition uh, contribution on an annual basis. So that's the unknown a little bit right now. Um, with regards to our, our levy rate, I know, um, Kurt, you had asked me about what other partner agencies are doing. I don't have a complete list. I did look at it a couple years ago when we were comparing us to park districts, you know, rec department versus a park district. Uh, we were at the near the bottom of that list as far as the lowest rate. Um, you can levy up to four cents. We're levying one cent, as you can see up here. So we are very low. Uh, what we can do. This does not fall under the required uh, tax cap. This can be levied up to the four cents, does not go into the citywide overall tax levy. However, the city has chosen to roll it into our total tax levy so that we try not to increase our levy, as you know, for, um, for the community other than what is the CPI. So, um, so that's a little bit of background on that. Um, Mary, just a quick question yeah. on that tax rate. It's gone up a tenth of a cent each of the last three years. Do we expect it to continue to go up going forward? Um, it, it could. That's what we're looking at now. That's where we're doing a five-year forecast based on once we have the transition plan done and once we have the, um, the facility dollars. Uh, we, well, we just got those now, so we have to take those into consideration. But that is what we're looking at and what that would, what that would mean, what that would look like. So, and can I just ask a <clears throat> question to clarify on the transition plan? That's that is to upgrade facilities and services to the new ADA. Correct under the new Title II uh, 2010 modifications that came out. So, um, we we had a company PHN Architects come in and do a full audit of all of our facilities and where they fell. Um, everything in there was. Um, identified as if you would outsource all the work, you know, to a contractor to do. And there's a number of things in there that um, we're, we're prioritizing or going through because, um, you know, it, we wouldn't do them unless we were going to do a, a major replacement. Um, an example is there's a couple parking lots where we're a quarter of an inch off on slope in the parking lot, and we wouldn't go in there and just rip that out for the quarter inch. But when we come, come when it comes around for its replacement, we would come get it up to compliance at that time. So we're having to sift through that and call that number down and make it a real practical and really identify the most critical things that are really producing barriers for participation. And we're going to be addressing those hopefully. Uh, the, the, as, you know, on, as a priority, I guess. Um, there's other things um, that we will do as time goes on, like all of our park benches, I think I might have mentioned this too, our park benches no longer meet the code. Um, they need to be 20, 20 or 22 inches deep. Um, 22, inches, 22 deep. inches deep. Most our park benches are 16 inches deep in all of our parks. So as we, as they wear out or we have opportunity to replace them over time, we'll do a few at each park so that we, you don't have to have every bench, but you have to have some benches in the parks that do meet that. So we'll slowly turn over some of those kinds of things. So we can look at how we want to pace that expense and how we want to fund that expense when we can put the two things together here. But again, the good news is within our existing levy, we have the ability to have that conversation as a park board as well as with city council as to, 
you know, you know, maybe part of our staff salaries are reduced so we can do this other without having, you know, to raise the levy. But that would mean expenses would go into the park and rec fund and you're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out a way to fund it on the other side, you know, if that's that. So um, Mary, just as an example, in 2012, it looks like there was a $30,000 surplus, over $30,000 surplus from what we collected via the tax rate versus what we spent. Correct. Where did that money go? Where's it stayed thing? in a fund balance for special rec levy. Right now we have about $244,000 in our fund balance for the special rec levy that has been built up since 2005. And that's where we're hoping to use part of that for immediate critical needs for the ADA transition plan or could be potentially a fund funding mechanism for this plan too. But it's currently just been uh, accumulating. So it, it may be possible to do this without increasing the tax rate. That's correct. That is correct. It should be possible to do this without increasing the tax rate. It sounds. It, like. it will depend on really what we want to do with the transition plan, the overall city transition plan to come into compliance. Because some items are very big. I mean, there's some items like um, making the the public safety building accessible because um, you have to have it accessible not only for the public but for employees and that right there was almost an eighty thousand dollar lift so that's where some of these items could be pretty big ticket items and could eat up our money very quickly um, but that's where we have to decide whether all of that comes out of the special rec levy does it come out of some of it out of the city's capital fund or do you know this is a funding mechanism that we're very low on <laughs> as far as you know utilizing our resources as a community to address these needs and when will we have a view of all of those obligations um, we will have the transition plan uh, ready for discussion with um, the uh, property and public lands committee and i'll we'll be inviting park board to join us in may okay. um, and then we'll have a better sense of um, all together what we're looking at cost wise and then I think we can have those conversations on how we want to use our levy and what should be in there. Um, but really, honestly, don't have a lot of um, leeway on the member agency contribution because that is a formula that's fair and equitable across all the, you know, all the member agencies. And uh, it's really defining, you know, you, you commit to that formula to be a member in there if you can't contribute your proportionate share then you that's when the, as an organization you would have to revisit that concept but um, I would hope we would never go in that way because we certainly don't have the resources to do what Craig's uh, team does for us so any other any other questions up from up there um, or that I can answer on that I will um, try to find out what the other partner agencies rates are and pull that together I, I just don't have a current list right now and that has been changing because partner agencies out there are raising their levy um, to address the same things we're wrestling, which is <laughs> their ADA plans. So, I, can I just ask you one question? Sure. Um, how have you seen growth of participants as well as your employees over, say, the last five years? Has there oh. been a, an, a, an insurgence in the need for a lot of this? And so, on page uh, 16 of the plan, uh, so from 2009 to 2012, which is 2012 was our last year. You, you can see our registrations are just over 7,000. Um, so, and then our individual served definitely jumped up between 2009 and 2010, and we've been able to maintain those moving forward. So, um, the one really uh, very positive uh, outcome of our 2012 stats uh, were that our core programs, which are the traditional programs that you have in front of you there, have really been growing. And those are our participants that use our programs all throughout the year and it's really our core. Our cooperative programs and our inclusion numbers for the first time um, across the board went down a little bit. Um, and those programs are equally as important, but our core uh, participants are uh, our adults and youth that have a disability and you know, we truly, especially for our adults, are their main social um, outlet and connection to their community. So um, our registration has been uh, really strong. Um, our surveys that we do now on a seasonal basis and a cumulative one as part of our strategic plan on an annual basis have been coming back extremely positive. Um, so NSSRA is trending very much uh, programmatically and financially in the right direction. Okay, well, thank you, Mary, for that. And, uh, 
this is just a breakdown, so this slide is a breakdown so that you can actually read it versus uh, the City of Lake Forest specific breakdown on page eight uh, for the capital plan. And those are the totals there and the average cost if you were to do it over 25 years. And that was a strategic direction from our board also that with this plan and our goal, um, not having a specific facility identified at this time, it's wise, it was decided that it's wisest for us to spread you know, this expense over 25 years uh, in a capital plan. And it's in the plan, but I haven't mentioned it yet. Um, capital expenses for NSSRA uh, in the past have been taken out of um, our operational budget. Um, and part of my task and the strategic plan uh, uh, asked us to address this, you know, this is the first time that we've actually documented and uh, start proposed that we have a capital fund for our capital needs at our agency um, in the same fashion that our 13 partners have. Craig, and this, the formula used for this is the same as the formula for determining the member contributions? Correct. So based on population and EAV. And EAV. And on an annual basis, this will, be, uh, this will not be a stagnant document. Um, every single year, as it says here, uh, this entire plan and specifically this page will be reviewed um, with the board and approved by the board um, and, and updated. We really feel confident that this is a very, very accurate uh, projection. Um, and, uh, but depending on EAV and population shifts, you know, there is a little bit of, of give and take between the 13 partners um, from year to year, depending on what's happening um, in each individual community. And, and I would say that um, as a board, we looked at you know, 10 year scenarios, we looked at 20 year scenarios, we looked at 25 year scenarios, trying to look at really what was financially um, appropriate for what, since we already have a member agency contribution that is using a great deal of our levy and trying to be sensitive to not raising our levies as much as possible, but still recognizing that this hopefully is a 25 year home at the very minimum for NSSRA and really trying to make sure that we have the ability then to spread out, if you will, our mortgage in a fashion that's fiscally ex capable for all the partners to participate in it. Um, and so, you know, it does vary, again, depending on your EAV and your population and what you're contributing, but, you know, $15,000 a year to have a, a quality long-term home for us providing a, the environment that NSSRA needs to, to deliver services for people with special needs, we felt was, you know, is isn't a huge additional chunk that we're, we're asking each community then to support. And we're one of the higher ones, but um, it gives you Mary, answer. you mentioned being able to pull the tax levies from the other member uh, participants. I'm not getting the words right, sorry. But I'd also like to see the uh, contribution per participant or contribution per registrant for each of the members, just to see if we're fully taking advantage of that $200,000 a year that we're paying. Yeah, building on follow me. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Building on that, uh, Craig, uh, it seems to me that that where your facility is located, to some degree, could uh, significantly impact. You know how much of each community uh, uses uh, the facilities. Although, although I suppose, since a lot of the programs you have are are distributed, uh, uh, maybe that's not as big of a factor. Could you just comment on that? Sure. A little bit? Um, the model of SRAs is uh, uh, when the law was put together in 1969 and then actually acted on in 1970, uh, the law very specifically says that an SRA has to have cooperating partners or agencies um, created. Um, because, and, and the simple reason behind that is um, there aren't enough individuals with disabilities in a standalone community to merit having you know, an agency just for them. Um, so that's why we have all 13 communities of the North Shore. So the way that we address that is, number one, our models for programs is specifically in all of our partner agency um, facilities and school district facilities. Number two, we have nine vehicles that our staff drive to make sure that a Lake Forest resident, if we have a bocce program in Winneka, um, which we do, uh, we mm -hmm. have a route that we'll start in Northbrook and pick up folks in Northbrook. We'll head north, we'll stop in Highland Park, we'll pick up some folks there, we'll head even, even further north, we'll stop between Lake Forest and Lake Bluff, grab participants there, then turn south. As we're coming down, we might stop in Glencoe or um, Wilmette, grab folks there, and then make it to Bocce. 
um, do our program, and then we re reverse that route. So what we try to uh, what we try to accomplish is that any resident of one of our 13 communities will have a pickup point um, within 10 minutes of their home so that it's very similar to if you live on this side of town and your baseball field you know for an able-bodied participant in the park district or rec department would have to travel to play baseball you drive those same 10 minutes to another facility our van will come and get you and we drive you to the program uh, we offer some door-to-door -door, like actually from house to house routes um, those are specifically for individuals with physical disabilities um, that typically use wheelchairs all the time. Um, and then the rest of our programs, and the majority of them, not all of them, but the great majority of them, have pickup points throughout our communities um, that we run for almost all of our programs. Um, and I'm sure you've seen, and if you haven't seen, you'll see them soon because now it'll be on your mind. You'll see, uh, you know, the <laughs> NSSRA vans driving through our communities, you know, between 8.15 in the morning and, you know, midnight, especially on a Friday and Saturday. But uh, you guys put a lot of miles on those vans. We do put a lot of miles, and as I mentioned, you know, our, our foundation funding all of our vans for us, you know, across the board is um, one of the greatest things. Uh, you know, it, we're, we're very, very, very fortunate. Um, yeah, because it's important. It's really our, our largest area, our biggest exposure when it comes to you know, um, our participants being with us. We put a lot of miles on the vehicles. Um, our, the new vehicles we're getting are, are stronger, are better, are safer, um, and our foundation has absolutely embraced that philosophy. Um, and they're in their second year now of funding all of that. But that's the work that our board and our staff you know, brought to a foundation saying, this is really important. And we, they run many fundraisers and, and, and create a lot of dollars for Where us. do those uh, vans get stored overnight? Uh, they're in our parking lot. Uh, the picture that you saw from our back, um, we were standing right in front of the vans there. So our nine vehicles are all in line right there. Uh, they're stored outside. Um, and, uh, you know, so in our, in our space needs analysis, you know, parking is definitely addressed in there, um, you know, for the vehicles that the agency owns because they're 15 passenger accessible buses. Um, our nine vehicles, uh, we have nine vehicles of which six have wheelchair lifts in them. Um, and then the other three are minivans and we have one 15 passenger non-lift vehicle um, that's just for ambulant uh, folks that are ambulatory. And, and Steve, I think the um, board is very um, aware of and, and hoping that we can put the administrative offices, which is basically what this is, with the, you know their training capabilities and storage, in as centrally located as we can with all the partner agencies. But you know we have to be practical about where our opportunities you know may come from as well. And there are a couple partner agencies that have potential. Um, expansions on the horizon um, that's a little unknown you know there because they're working through their strategic plans and or their their uh, interest in their community to have that so that's why we have them on a horizon but we've looked at we went and looked at some commercial properties um, that we thought might potentially work um, you know once we looked at the cost to retrofit them make them you know fit the kind of needs that NSSRA would have uh, the cost was so similar to building new it wasn't as desirable but also too, a lot of the commercial spaces were right back in commercial areas and didn't have green space around them or didn't have the synergy of you know having shared services right down the hall or the ability to you know have uh, our staff interacting in a, with a partner so those are some of the trade-offs that we're, we're very much aware of and we're, we're still you know going to be taking a look at because we don't have we haven't identified a future home right. but it is something that we're going to have as these opportunities come up we'll have to look at those pros and cons and is it the right fit and um, I can tell you when I worked for um, Park District of Highland Park at that time NSSRA was in a wing of the Westridge Center off of Ridge Road in Highland Park and they outgrew it there and so that's when you know they then moved to New Trier campus actually they were on the west campus because that was vacant and so they were there for a while and then the new Trier needed the campus back, and so Innesis Ray was homeless again. So that's when Northbrook stepped up and said, we'll help you with the corporate complex. And then that's when they ended up moving to Northbrook. So they've been moving around over the years trying to find that best fit. And I think we've 
I think as partners have learned and looked at, it seems like you know the best fit was when it was with a parent, with a, a fellow partner agency. Um, and so that's kind of why right. a lot of the philosophy here behind this is to try to use those kinds of opportunities. That's not to say if we don't come up, you know, if we come up or we see a great commercial space that is different or has those things, has we'll certainly process. be looking at it. Um, but we said so do you goal, have real estate professionals on retainer, so to speak, that are continually scanning the market for yes. suitable space? We have, um, we, we did the research and put out an RFQ, um, and uh, we have a relationship with a realtor. Um, and until this plan, which just was approved by our board at our last board meeting, um, got done, we haven't signed anything yet, um, but that's what we're moving towards doing. We've done the RFQ, we have a recommendation to the board. The board has asked us, and our council has asked us, you know, don't sign anything until this plan is done and you really have, uh, it's just wisest to wait for our direction to be set. Um, and one other thing that Mary didn't mention, the trend in our field, and our field is small, we, there's 33 other SRAs, but in the Chicagoland area, um, over the last 10 years, uh, the, eight, the SRAs that are of like size to us, they've all um, been moving in with their partners. So Fox Valley Special Rec is in with Fox Valley um, Park District. Uh, Northwest Special Rec, which is the biggest, is in Rolling Meadows with the Rolling, Me Rolling Meadows Park District. So um, this goal and the trend, it's just more efficient, and, and to be honest with you, um, our staff of 20 full-time staff, we're not building people, we're recreation people, and park districts have you know park departments that know how to fix toilets and address if there's a roof leak or you know this, that, or the other, um, while that's really not our, our, our training and, um, um, or our expertise. So for efficiency's sake, it just makes, um, it really makes best sense, in my opinion, um, for us to, to have that as a goal, you know, but goals are just that. That's what we're aspiring to accomplish, and, and I know our board is very open to, you know, different options as they come down the pike. Well, I can finish up this real quick, and then we can, can continue on with, um, with questions. New facility benefits, um, you know, much like my fourth slide, um, you know, our goal is to have meeting rooms um, that serve our purposes and allow us to have private conversations with our families and participants. Um, the addition of programming and training space, um, you know, training-wise, uh, we offered more than 900 hours of training last year for our staff across the board. Uh, in the summertime, when inclusion and summer camp kick off, um, we train over 200 people um, just in inclusion for the summertime. We shut down the Glencoe Takeoff Center last year. We had residents complaining that we were parked in the, in the streets for the three days that we were because it was so full. Um, Safety-wise, we've already talked about that. Office space for our staff, um, we have identified you know, that uh, we're in need of 27 to 29 office spaces, which would uh, take care of our staff plus interns, because we typically have between two and four interns a year. And then in the summertime, when we have our entire army of folks there, um, office space is at a premium. Storage, we've already talked about, and I think Mary said it well, you know, the feeling to have a new home with a partner agency uh, for efficiency sake and just being a recreation agency in a recreation setting um, just really sends the right message, and we think it is a definite priority. Um, require process to acquire a new facility. Being a, an association of 13 partners, there are steps, and this is step number one, which is putting together this plan and communicating it with our <coughs> partner boards. Um, in the future, as, uh, so, so that's number one. Number two, our staff and board uh, will be looking at and evaluating um, potential opportunities uh, moving towards a proposal to bring to our, through our board and then to our 13 partner boards um, to find a new permanent home for NSSRA. Uh, number three, I'll touch on this just briefly, but and we'll be back to you in the future about this. The building that we presently have, we own. And because we are an association of 13 partners, in essence, it's owned by our 10 park districts, two cities, and one village. There are very specific laws um, in the park district code pertaining to a park district or a rec department um, disposing of or selling uh, property. Um, we're under three acres, we're just actually over a half of an acre. Um, and we uh, will have to, since we're in Cook County, we'll have to bring a resolution um, to the courts 
basically to get permission to put the, this property up for sale. Um, it is a process. It's very purposeful because, you know, again, park districts and rec departments, their, their job is to create green space. We have a half of an acre building in an industrial park, which is not green space or recreational space, it's industrial space. So um, that is just one step that we will have to bring back to our boards in the near future. Um, but we didn't want to put it in with this presentation because there's already so many moving parts we didn't want to uh, um, confuse or make it um, over complex. And then number four, five, six, and seven are the steps. Uh, and the steps as we see them is uh, for the NSSRA board um, to approve a contract for a new facility and then bring that to, a part, to its partner boards for approval, followed by um, a, an agreement or a contract to sell our existing building, followed by bringing that because in essence, our 13 partners own it um, for our partner board's approval there. Piece of cake. Oh yeah, it should be you know, 13 <laughs> partners and- Simple. Craig, there was a discussion about using the proceeds from the sale of the building as a down payment for the new facility. Great, and I, I know you had put a question in there. I'll address that. Um, as quickly as I possibly can. Um, we did some research uh, pertaining to what should, what is the wisest timing um, to take on this adventure. Um, and the research showed that uh, we, we had our building um, appraised. It appraised at just under seven to $700,000. So um, taking that into account, um, we did research and if we were to sell the building for approximately $500,000, you know, just as a number. Um, and then rent space between now- Let the record show that's not an offer. That's not, yeah, it's not, yeah we, we have no <laughs> offers or anything like that, but this is just a number to put down. Um, the building, um, if we were to sell and use those, that money to lease space between now and when we expect to move in, which is 2018, but that's not guaranteed. It could be earlier or later. Um, we would have $182,000 left over um, after four years of rent. If we were to hold on to uh, the building that we presently have in Northbrook and use it, uh, operationally and financially, it, is a, it, it, it fits better. The building um, could sit for five and a half years after we move out um, and into our new building um, and still be more financially advantageous and operationally um, we wouldn't have to disrupt our operations, communicate to our families, et cetera. We'd have $200,000 according to our estimates um, if we were to have the building sit idle for five and a half years. And that also takes into account um, putting in $250,000 of capital repairs to the building while it sits there, whether it be HVAC or parking or windows or anything like that. So very conservatively speaking, it could sit for five and a half years and still be uh, a, a smarter move for us financially and clearly operationally um, to wait until we secure, and when we say when we secure a new building, when we sign on the dotted line to either purchase or renovate or start construction with a partner for a new facility, um, we're estimating that it'll take between you know, 16 and 24 months from when we sign on the dotted line to when we get the keys and we actually get to move in. So between that, you know, in that 18 month period, our hope is to market the building very aggressively and hopefully find a buyer. Um, we are talking with neighbors in um, our area, but we have no specific leads right now. But we put a lot of time and effort into that research to figure you know, what is the smartest way to do this. And our research showed that operationally and financially, um, it's wisest for us to secure a new building, which means sign for it, and then put the, uh, the building that we're in on the market. So if you end up holding it for five and a half years, presumably you've got another source for the down payment? Uh, yeah, then that would change. You know, that would be another moving part. So um, that $500,000 or whatever the sale price might be, um, we, we would have to, that would change the financing formula there. That's just one of, the, one of the many variables in this plan when we don't have a specific facility with its cost and its location that we can demonstrate to everybody. Um, but the, goods, the um, good news, much like your facilities, we pay no property tax on our facility. It's off the property tax. So if, a, if the building were to sit there for even a month or two months or whatever, um, it's just utilities, you know, and making sure that we're keeping it from any damage, you know, whether it be weather or vandalism or anything like that. 
Obviously, I, I would say again, as the board, we're, um, we're very anxious to, as we start to approach those conversations, we kind of have a sense that we have opportunity on our plate to really touch back in with our realtor, touch back in with you know what our opportunities are, because the quicker we divest ourselves of the building, sure. obviously the better it is for everyone. So that is a goal that we have. It's just, uh, we're looking at worst case scenarios here and trying to make sure that we aren't, uh, have a gap where we actually have to move into temporary housing that, you know, because we're in between and we end up with disruption and, and not able to deliver the services that we've been doing. So it, it is a moving target. Uh, again, it's just a plan, but annually we'll have to look at that and what's come up new and, and anything we've learned, you know, that's come on the, on the, to the horizon, but um, that could change. Right. And as I said at the beginning, you know, the, knowingly, um, you know, there are a, a number of assumptions with this plan, um, but, you know, following that goal and, um, and, and it, it's a very purposeful and important goal. Um, it was staff and, and our facility committee's responsibility, you know, to do the research and, and get down some real numbers to, you know, provide a, a fair and accurate, as best we can, forecast as to how to best attain this goal. I think uh, the other thing I would mention to you is that uh, we kind of like the fact we have a window ahead of us to work through some of these items. Like I said in my write-up to you is this isn't going to be fast moving with all the partners and everything that's associated with it, but we're hoping the, the, uh, the economy, you know, and, and building prices can recover a little bit so we'll get, you know, maximize it because we went from 700,000 down to around 500 and we're hoping we can, you know, get back closer to that 700 sure. by, at the point in time that we need to sell, so. Um, timeline to sell, we just talked about that. Um, and then NSSRA uh, finances and participation. At the back of the plan, uh, this is just a quick um, kind of overview of financially and participation wise where we are, where we're going, uh, kind of what our trends are. Um, so if you look at page number 13, um, our funding sources come from three, spot, um, from three categories. Uh, first, our partners, second, our program fees, and third, outside, uh, outside funding, which includes our foundation. Um, between 2009 and 2012, you can see um, that the amounts that we're receiving revenue-wise in program and outside sources are growing, which is really great news. Um, and we're, we're able to, as best we can, stabilize uh, the partner contribution uh, coming our way. Um, Revenue-wise, uh, we have, and, and budget-wise, over the last number of years on page number 14, you can see you know, that um, budget versus actual, we've had some uh, very positive years uh, moving uh, since 2009 uh, till now, um, resulting in a, in a healthy fund balance, um, which is fantastic. Uh, Chairman Kurt had uh, asked a question about um, on the second to last page, our operational budget. Um, and the operational budget here um, does show, and, and it's just a simple 3% uh, projection of revenue and expenses moving forward for 2013 through 2017. Um, and you can see um, that as an agency um, that subsidizes programs tremendously, um, our goal is to break even and have our member AC contribution, you know, be such that we have a break even budget. We've been close to that when it comes to budgeting. We've high, we've, we've more than exceeded that when it comes to actuals between, between 2009 and 2012. Um, and we're hoping from our past experience with the team we have in place and the leadership um, and direction from our board that over the next number of years, our full intention is to continue to do that. And I think this projection shows that we're, there, that we're right there in the ballpark. Um, but I don't ever want to doctor any numbers when we do a pure 3% you know, um, uh, calculation across the board um, on a break-even budget. There are some variances. And if you look here, the variances basically pertain to capital um, expenditures, which in the capital plan, they, they uh, gravitate up and down depending on our vehicles, um, and our technology needs and our upkeep for our present building. Um, so, you know, from uh, looking from 2009 to 2012 plus this plan, um, I think it's a, um, we're, we're in a strong financial and participation and agency point uh, in our history uh, to have a plan like this, um, which was grown out of or born out of our strategic plan, um, which we've been working on um, uh, very specifically over the last number of years. 
And I do want to say that um, as a board member, um, I'm always concerned when I see budgets that project an operational net loss. And even though these are very small, they're 10,000 or 8,000, the reality is that NSSRA hasn't suffered those kind of losses. That's the, the budgeting formula that they've typically shown to be very conservative, but they don't have a track record of losses. They actually have been net profiting you know, every year off of the, the last several years. So um, it is one of those things that, um, again, it's a conservative budget, worst case kind of scenario here you're seeing, but the reality is that that hasn't been really what, they're, what they've been actually able to, to accomplish when you look at the chart on the page before. I mean, they've been, you know, anywhere from, uh, you know, 100,000 and into the plus, um, you know, depending on the year that they have, depending on capital too, so. And if you look on the, the chart at the top of page 14, um, you can look at our budget versus actual there. And 2011 stands out, you know, when we budgeted to have a $161,000 deficit. And that was um, exclusively relating to capital because that was the year that um, with the uh, help of Glenview Park District and our foundation and their foundation, we renovated Willow Park um, uh, Fieldhouse as an exclusive uh, program use space for us. Um, and we had some expenses related to that. Um, and that, w and we also bought a van that year. So um, that was a break-even budget outside of capital. As I, as I mentioned before, NSSRA has taken its capital expenses out of its operational budget um, up until this proposal starting in 2014. And then participation trends in Lake Forest, you can see, um, you know, our, our, the numbers in Lake Forest grew uh, between 2011 and 2000. Uh, and 12, which is great. So there's 45 families that we're presently serving and uh, their family members are signing up for 356 registrations um, for the year. And Mary provided you with a breakdown of, you know, those specific areas um, in, in your packet. I really appreciate your patience because I know it took a lot <laughs> of your time, um, uh, but I would love to answer any questions that you may have or continue to have. and. Um, and just so Again, you know, this so is much. Craig's first, we're the first out of the box to oh, come good. before the boards and talk. Um, he's done a little bit with Riverwoods in an informal setting, but um, this is really, we're kind of the, right. I wanted to get us talking we about it. this and Mary said, can you come out? I said, and I looked at my calendar. Um, primarily because I know our ADA transition plan will be coming up in May, so I wanted to begin to get this dialogue going so we can look at it comprehensively as a group. So, um, so we know we've put a lot in here for you tonight, but. So I have one more question, Craig. Yes. Um, I think you've made a, a very strong case for the need for a new facility. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you made a good, or provided a good explanation of why relocating with a partner agency makes the most sense, and you said that's kind of a trend. What happens if none of the 13 partner agencies can afford to relocate or expand over the next five years? What are you gonna do? You mean partner with us, if, or say- If you're waiting for a partner agency, to relocate, expand, so that you can implement your plan. What right. if none of the 13 can afford to do that over the next five years? Yeah, then we're going to be patient as a board and as a staff. Um, you know, the building we're in right now has many deficits and deficiencies, but we're operating in it. Um, and we're very tight. Um, it's not the best location, it's not the best setting, um, but we've been operating out of it since 2001. Um, and strategically, it's important, and that's where a permanent location for NSSRA is really an important um, uh, phrase to focus in on. Um, Mary said, you know, this is going to be a 25-year solution. I want it to be, you know, a 25-plus year solution, a permanent solution, because NSSRA has been in Northfield, at Westridge, at New Trier, now in Northbrook, you know, in an in industrial setting. Um, as the executive director here and, and the strategic plan, you know, is, is, is asking us to, you know, to, to solve this problem. Um, we've talked at, at the board level and said, you know, if this takes us eight years or nine years or 10 years and we get it done right one last time, um, that's good. Um, and my sense, Mary, from talking with the, with the board, we specifically, the facility committee asked all partners to, you know, take a look at any type of renovations or acquisitions that you may see, you know, coming down the pike in the future, master plan wise. And as you do, please, you know, uh, please keep NSSRA in mind because we are you, you are us. Um, and, and, and please, you know, try to work us in 
uh, when an opportunity shows itself. So, Kurt, I don't have a specific timeline, um, and I guess one shining or one silver lining to this is if it takes 10 years, um, this capital plan will set us up financially in a, a more advantageous spot so even fewer dollars go to any type of interest payment. You know, because we're doing a 25-year plan, you know, uh, shared amongst the partners. Um, so uh, I, I can't look into the future. I'm optimistic that the 2018 horizon, um, you know, event horizon will occur. Um, and I can just say I, I keep my fingers crossed. I, I, I think the plan is, is well thought out. We put a lot of effort into it. And, uh, you know, and real estate, from my experience, and it's very small, is it's, it's always changing. And, um, you know, we may be back here in two and a half years saying, oh, my gosh, this is the opportunity. Um, and, I, and I hope we can, you know, exceed what our very conservative projections are here. You know, that's our goal, and that's why we're working with our foundation and our families to, to get this information out because it's also a great story, you know, to find a better home for the participants of the North Shore that have disabilities, you know, to enhance their recreation. Um, it's a good story to share with everyone, uh, and it's something that, um, from my experience, a lot of folks have been very supportive of. And I, think, I hope that continues. I think the other thing, too, is that we're hoping by starting these conversations, we're pulling in more people who have maybe connections or ideas that we don't know of. You know, it, who knows what's in somebody's back door, you know, backyard or in their community that they hadn't been thinking about or something's changed. And, you know, we, as an example, went out and looked at Volweiler as an example on the Grove Cultural Campus. Um, because they thought, you know, that has a potential right setting. It's a beautiful setting out there. It's right on the border on, and on a major road, 22, so you can get to Highland Park, Lake Bluff, you know, Lake Forest, Deerfield, you know, uh, Riverwoods. It, it's, a, it's a great location. Um, and so we did take a look at that as an example. Um, obviously, mu moving pieces for the city as well, because there's a current tenant there and um, timing and stuff. But who knows what other opportunities are like that. And, you know, as we start talking and our city council gets involved and there's a number of individuals that through their businesses might have leads for us. That's all the kind of thing we don't know yet. So we'll look at all of them. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the partner agencies, uh, you know, they, they are going to have to take this through their community if they're going to be adding in their community. And we'll know ahead of time whether those are options to vet with you or not. So. Other questions? Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. And I, thanks, Craig. again, thanks for all good, the time. Very good you, presentation. Uh, yeah, good presentation. Good luck with that. Thank you so much. We'll keep you up to speed, I promise. Thank you. Is Joe still here? <laughs> oh, he is, yeah. He's Joe awake. Next item is a uh, discussion of the transportation bid, recreation transportation bid by Joe Mobile. Hi, Joe. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Um, I am here this evening to go through our, uh, our busing bid process and ask for your approval to move forward. Um, each year, the Recreation Department, as well as CROIA, have busing needs. Uh, ours are mostly uh, through our summer camp programs, and we offer uh, Superstars Day Camp, McCormick Day Camp. We offer daily transportation to and from camp for all Lake Forest residents who sign up for those two programs, as well as uh, afternoon swim shuttles and field trip busing for other various camps, including those. And then CROIA, they have a need for busing for their monthly trips, as well as uh, retreats that they take throughout the year and so you know we go out to bid as a as a unit to try to uh, secure the best pricing that we can through the process um, in February we went out to bid uh, for a three-year agreement uh, and had three bus companies reply back and responded to the bid process and the three companies were Olson Transportation Durham School Services and First Student. Uh, Olson and First Student have bid, this is the third bid process that we've attempted or that we have gone through with our, with our busing needs. Um, and they have been a part of it since the beginning. And Durham was a, a new entrant into it this year. So it was nice to see that we have actually uh, grown through the process. Um, by doing this bid um, for a three year agreement, we're hoping to take our future uh, costs and maximize you know maximize and lock them in this year for a three-year agreement as well as um, getting the commitment and the service consistency that we need for our camp program 
um, for the next three years. If we have to continually do this annually and switch companies, you know, it's new routes, it's getting used to companies. And so we wanted to, you know, lock it in for a three year agreement. Um, so as you can see on the chart uh, in front of you, uh, the pricing that came in for the recreation department, Olson Transportation was the lowest bid price in each of the years, as well as the accumulation of the total three year package. Um, our busing costs are currently in our program budgets for all of our camps that utilize busing. And the amount of the $122,068 and change over the three year period of the contract is less than the $134,700 that we have currently in our budget over uh, uh, or for this upcoming uh, or over the period of the, uh, the budget. So um, by going through the process, we have been able to attract a lower price than what we had um, you know, budgeted within our program. Um, looking forward into the Croya section, uh, two of the bids came in fairly close and the company that we've currently used um, was quite a bit higher. So um, there seems to have been some discrepancies or some inconsistencies with the way that the wording in the bus uh, bid for that service. So, um, you know, I think we'll get some further information as I move forward. But what we're doing is we would like to, based on the information and the cost provided in front of you, we would like to at this time uh, recommend that we offer Olson Transportation uh, the three-year contract for the Recreation Department's program busing based on one being the low bid price as well as to continue with the consistency that we've had over the past you know, several years in our programs. Um, and offer them the agreement or the contract at $122,068.25, as well as we're requesting that um, we decline and reject all three bids for Croyo. Um, and the reason being is based on the inconsistencies in the, the bid specifications that were sent out. Um, by declining all three of those bids, Croyo will then um, go out and clarify the specifications and receive quotes for those uh, from those companies with uh, better specifications, more clear understanding of you know, where they're going, how many hours per trip, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's not just a base price, it's you know, getting all of the information that we, we overlooked. So um, we are asking at this time that the Park and Recreation Board approve the contract for Olson Transportation for the three-year agreement uh, and then reject all the bids for Croya, and we'll move. Uh, Croya will then move forward collecting quotes. Are there questions? Yes. Sorry, um, I understand why you're doing that, but how does does that put Croya at a disadvantage at all in trying to get a, a bulk um, rate? You know, their portion of this um, is such a small uh, amount compared to the entire uh, entire uh, cost of the bid. You know, it may come back a little bit higher, but um, per our policy, you know, if it's over 5,000, they need to get quotes. Currently, two of the companies are under that. Um, so I don't think it's going to raise it to where it's going to be such a disadvantage. Okay. What's our budgeted amount for the Croya piece? Um, you know what? That I do not have. I don't know if you. Um, I don't know Croya's budget in Mount either. We, yeah. we, they have their department. I do know that they've also, you know, used Olson Transportation for the last uh, three years as we have, and it has been in our discussions when we were putting this together, it has been right around the five thousand dollar mark based on which trips get canceled and which, you know, run, and um, you know, but I don't have a budgeted amount. I, I think, per you know, year. I think. I think that was the unfortunate thing with the bid because there, all it said was X number of trips. It didn't have any detail to it. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I, I didn't really see that bid before it went out um, for the Croya portion of it. And so what these companies are bidding on is unclear. And they could come back later and say, you know, this, there's extra hours. Because they did put on their quote, this is their base, and then they put a per hour extra charge. Well, not knowing all the trips with all the hours, when you add potentially add that up, then they could be higher than what would look like the low bid here is. And um, 
that's I think Olson who they've yeah. used Olson did based it upon what they thought their trips were last year because they had insider kind of information to that so we really want to make sure that what these companies bid on they're going to be able to live within and that it's accurate for what services we're going to be asking them to provide and and Croya like I said it's a very small amount this will be price quotes versus a full you know it'll be out to companies in a formal process but they won't have to necessarily go through a lengthy bid process because of the dollar amount so they'll be able to move ahead timely enough that they'll be able to figure out their summer program easily so that's why we looked at separating we felt our prices were very competitive so we would hate to turn them down now and not lock that in when it was less than our budgeted estimate that we had so are there synergies by having the same company do both rec and croya in other words if we ended up with olson doing rec and first student doing croya is that yeah. more inefficient in any way no croya's trips are two destinations do their own thing, huh? so they would they would call or you know however would contact the bus company and say we need two buses to go to a cubs game in june the two buses would show up, take them downtown, wait, and come back. You know, ours is picking up the children, you know, before camp and dropping them off after. So the synergies, ours is throughout the community. Theirs is just like you know, destination trips. So I don't see that being an issue at okay. all. Okay, I, I have a question. I it would uh, somebody's got to ask <clears throat> relative to uh, uh, safety, um, and I'm sure everybody's thinking that, uh, but. Um, our kids are, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, precious asset we have. So um, I, I presume you guys have a, a, some sort of set of specifications on the safety side that, uh, that all these companies uh, would meet somehow. Uh, yeah, that, that was all in the, uh, in the specifications that were sent out. Um, you know, they have to provide us with their insurance, and we uh, requested background checks once the companies you know, approved. Uh, background checks on all of their drivers. Um, so yes, we do take the safety very seriously. Radio communication. Yep, yep, and and you know each bus and actually each bus has a radio on it, and we're given the radio for each driver. So if we have an issue, we can contact the drivers directly, and versus having to go to the hub. And you know, I mean, you know, quite candidly, compared to anything else we talk about, that you know, in this in this area, that this, you know, whether it's. 122,000 or 132,000 frankly doesn't care I don't care that much what I care about is that we you know well, and I'm sure you guys feel the same way I guess I just want to ask the question and make sure we really have that as a as a I'd put it priority number one there really isn't even a second oh no definitely the safety of the kids is, is the top priority um, you know we did use years and years ago we, we had first student and then we went to the first time it was 2008 went to the bid process Olson came in with the lower price so you know I was tentative. It was tough to switch companies, but you know, Olson has been our vendor now since 2008, and you know they have a very good track record. Um, we're very confident, you know, in what their services are, and you know, quite frankly, the routes don't change a lot year to year. So you know, the safety's been there. We haven't had issues with drivers, and if we have, you know what, they've taken care of the situation before the next morning of routes. So you know, it's been a very, uh, very uh, smooth and you know re relationship thus far. Good. So. so if we approve this, you'll come back then with the results from the CROIA bid process? Um, actually, because the CROIA amount is so low, they don't need to go through a formal process. Um, I don't know, Mary, if we're going to come back with that, but I think they'll be, they'll be seeking out quotes to where they'll contact the companies with the new specifications. They don't need approval based on a quote other than the, the department head. So I don't they'll think the, they'll Croya go through the city standard um, pricing policies, and Croya being as an independent quote now, they're not part of the park. They're not under the park and rec department. It was only because they were lumped in with our bid that you were seeing their numbers as it was, and so we could then take it on to council. But if they're separate, it's going to be a dollar amount that they can just do that independently through their department head and through the city manager, and not through park board approval process. And it's, it's similar, I mean, back in 2008 when we did this for the first time, uh, the senior center, their busing was a part of that bid. And they were able to continue with the way that they bust cheaper than what the bids came in at. So we declined their bid back then, and now they just get quotes you know, per trip on their own. Similar to what possibly may happen with the Croya portion is we may be only moving forward after the three year just looking at the parks and recreation side because we do have a, a pretty hefty um, you know, total of our are we in a, are we in a uh, time crunch do we have to approve this now 
Uh, we don't, other than that, um, we do start to work with the companies as far as once registration happens, as far as they need to lock in so we know we're going to get our bus number of buses because they're they're having poten they're bidding potential multiple projects, trying to lock down their business for the summer. So if we don't lock in with Olson and we wait a month when we go in to say we are interested in them, that if they've already committed their buses to another community, then we're going to be challenged. So, so we really are, we yeah. do have a time issue. Uh, it's, oh. it's the time of the year where they're looking for that, that comfort. And I will tell you that Olson is also used by the school district in town. So they have a very strong uh, visible profile in the community to deliver good service and, and deliver a good price to us as well. But um, again, we risk that potential of you know going back to them and saying we want to accept and then them saying we don't have the ability to to provide those needs right now so um it could I, I, well, I think we're a big vendor but it could happen and, and we also have to you know take this to, to city council as well for their approval um and the timing of us having to go to that and then be able to provide uh whichever bus company uh at the beginning of may we have to provide them with our first draft of uh, participants so they can start putting routes together so we start, you know, early on, and if the longer we wait, then, you know, the more chance of something getting missed or, you know, some errors. Hmm. So I guess my only concern is the appearance that we're rebidding the second part because we didn't get the vendor that we want. And I'm fairly familiar with the public bidding process, and I know the, uh, the bidders who lose are always complaining that, well, we didn't read it right, we didn't understand it, the directions weren't clear enough. That's a very common complaint. Um, so I guess while I understand what you're saying, I would certainly hope that the next time we go back, we write these specifications clear enough so that this type of thing rarely, if ever, happens. And Dan, it was all three companies had different way that they bid at Acroya. One had just a base rate at whatever per bus, and that's all they had. The other had the base rate, plus they put a quote up top, you know, saying each additional hour is X. And then the third based it on actual knowledge of what we do. So that's why I think it was so you know, all over the place. Yes, we need to be much more clear with the, with the CROIA portion. Um, you know, and possibly moving forward, it's not part of the full process because of the, the lower dollar amount. Yeah. Well, well, I would well, think it would still, it still probably ought to be part of the process just from an appearance standpoint, but that's just my two cents. Well, I guess I would, I would move to recommend awarding the Recreation Department contract to Olson Transportation and would recommend uh, submitting the CROIA part back for a second bidding process. And just to be clear, the wording is we're not seeking the budget amount, we're seeking the contract amount of the 122, right. correct? We are, we are seeking the 122,000 uh, quoted price from Olson Transportation, not the budget amount. Do we have a second? I second that. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion approved. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Next item is the update on the Deer Path Golf Course. And what's going to be Jeff? It's going to be Mary now. Jeff is uh, meeting with the Wildlife Discovery Center Advisory Board tonight, so I'm filling in for him. And I'm going to make this very quick because a lot of this I think, um, you know, you're somewhat familiar with anyhow. Um, but I just want to keep you in the loop of what's happening with Deer Path as we approach the 2013 golf season. Um, and the first thing here is the uh, membership numbers. Trish, will that pull up it any higher? Um, and uh, as you saw in your packet, uh, currently this uh, chart shows that we ran the numbers as of March 12th, 2013, compared to March 31st of 2012. That's just we have, we're still working off the old Crescent system for the prior year numbers. And at that point in time, we are down 37 memberships compared to last year. However, I wanted to mention a couple influencing factors in that number. Obviously, we still had two weeks left of March last year to go into these numbers. It was 80 degrees <laughs> last year in March, and people were already out playing on the golf course, and so there was a lot of, a lot of enthusiasm to begin the golf season. So we know that we're lagging a little bit behind from a weather perspective. 
Um, and then, you know, we, we also changed the date, uh, the cutoff date for the early bird incentive. So last year that um, you had all the way till April 1st to come buy your memberships and we did it this year by February 15th. And so any memberships that we are selling at this point in time will be at a 3% higher uh, rate than what the uh, members got that signed up by February 15th. The other um, item in there, it's a pretty big one is, um, I'll try to highlight that line, is the junior memberships right here. That's 14 of those uh, memberships uh, that we're down in. And that's because um, what we do is we sell those half memberships for those that are taking the uh, clinics with us during the summer. And those sales are just beginning. And so we anticipate a very strong return rate on our junior members um, through Richard Franklin's program. So I think we're gonna make that number up pretty quickly. However, that's not to say we aren't concerned. And so staff have been um, doing some extra diligence um, they will be reaching out. They've already started, but they'll be continuing to call our past members and encouraging them to come in and get their memberships taken care of. Um, we did talk about uh, a little bit with the advisory committee. Um, I was informed that we had 36 new um, homes closed on, uh, resident homes closed on, for instance, uh, in Lake Forest this past month. And so those are kinds of opportunities that we're looking at trying to get information out to new residents and say, pick Deer Path Golf Course and here's some rec services that you know you can take advantage of. So we're gonna do a little bit of a target market to something that um, we haven't maybe taken advantage of enough before. Um, and then the last thing is uh, really we, we start our bi-weekly email blast once the season opens. And so we anticipate that around April 1st. And I think when we continue to have that awareness campaign going on, that will hopefully push our membership uh, sales where we need. However, industry-wise, membership is still a declining aspect of the industry. We are seeing an uptick in rounds. And that's a good thing, so we think that means golf in some way is recovering, but not from a membership perspective. So we're hoping that we projected our membership uh, dollar amount for budget to be flat this year. We did not project any new members compared to last year, but we didn't pro project the growth off of um, the in increase in membership fees if they signed up late. So we were very conservative, you know, in that perspective. Um, and then membership, just so you know, represents about 33% of our revenue stream. The rest is all really from our daily rounds, our, call, our cart fees, and then uh, small outing business and restaurant stuff that we have. It's interesting to see the uh, non-resident numbers growing. I mean, pretty consistently across all the different categories. I mean, not, not big numbers, but you know, go in the right direction, interesting. And we'll continue to push that and hope that. And I think part of that too is um, we're really gonna see some advantage, I think, on the dynamic pricing that we have because there's not a distinction for daily fees between resident and non-resident if you do the online uh, daily fee purchases. So I think that's gonna be great. Um, and that leads right to the permanent tea time. Our current members have an opportunity to lock down uh, permanent tea times on Saturdays and Sundays. And this past uh, Saturday, we had our lottery. Uh, Scoo was at it, and Scoo got the last draw on a Saturday tea time, so he was thrilled. <laughs> um, so he's got an early bird start, don't you, Scoo? Um, but it really, um, it, it, was a, it was a fun morning, again, to reconnect with all of our golfers. But we are down in our permanent tea times. And that's a number of factors, again, I think that uh, it's a combination, I should say. And that is partly because um, we have some members that had taken Saturday and Sunday times that weren't always playing and leaving those tea times open, which has been a concern of ours. And now that we're saying we're gonna focus on that and really in, um, say that you need to commit and be there to play, so, and if not, let us open those tea times. So there were groups that, um, we had one group that chose, for instance, to not have that situation. We had some just attrition. We had groups where members um, who played in the past had medical issues and can't play this season um, and we had those that uh, just for time commitments with their new business or jobs they have they couldn't do it so it's kind of a mixed bag again if there's a silver lining here these were members who are playing the course and um, if they're not using that tea time we can now put it back in the mix at high rack rate you know this is prime time that we can get the uh, you know the top dollar for and we'll be able to allow new people come to our course and hopefully those new people will see us as a great opportunity to become a member you know in the future or to play us on a consistent basis so we will begin to really market um, the fact that we now have tea times on saturday and sunday mornings open to the public that we in essence haven't had in the past 
Um, so that, that's kind of, a, a, I guess, a positive out of this. Um, we always want to have a good solid base from our members using the course, but it is a, a unique opportunity, something that has changed. Um, next slide. I just wanted to mention really quickly that we've done some clubhouse improvements. We have, uh, we went ahead and invested in some carpeting throughout the clubhouse because we had some seam issues and some trip hazards there. And the new carpeting looks fantastic. Does it look fantastic, Scoo? Oh, awesome. It's fantastic. Um, and we expanded our restaurant space by removing things like we had a large seating area in the corner with leather chairs and, and we took out some uh, tables where they actually did their um, uh, handicap. Uh, they would go and log on to the computers and things and we uh, changed the location of that. So we have a little more room, you know, elbow room in the restaurant itself and it looks really nice. And uh, we have completed our contract, executed a contract with Kemper Sports to run the restaurant component of it. And that's really going to provide us with some great synergy between the pro shop operation and the, and the restaurant. So if we have a rain delay and we have people there waiting, you know, we can say, have a Coke on us. We didn't have that flexibility in the past, not managing both, you know, sides of the business. Um, or if we want to do some special things with our members' appreciation days, you know, it's easy to work with because we can tie those together. And then for the outing business, just the aspect that it's a one-stop shop. If you want to run an outing now, you call our pro shop. The pro shop can tell you the prices it's going to be for the food component as well as for the golf component. And, you know, we can just efficiently give you answers on what it's going to take if you want to bring your outing business to Deer Path. So some real positives, I think, uh, from this perspective. Um, Tom Wilson's will still be uh, overseeing our maintenance division and managing the, the conditions of the course. And the guys are slowly coming back with seasonals to get us up and going before the weather has, a, you know, made it very easy. So um, then the other thing I couldn't, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our outstanding lesson program with Richard Franklin. Um, he did a demonstration at the permanent tea time on some of the technology and the really amazing uh, information that you can learn if you take a lesson that will improve everyone's game regardless of what level you're at. And uh, he's, Richard Franklin will be offering the three week junior camp. Um, he still has the PGA Sports Academy. We'll be offering demo days again throughout the summer uh, so you can try out some of the latest and greatest in equipment um, with discounts on those days. We're going to have our family day again this summer uh, where we encourage uh, you know, all ages to come out and enjoy the course. And then we'll also be a PGA um, US Kids Family Golf Course, which allows us to take advantage of um, some special activities that are related to that, make it really kind of special that you're in a kind of a bigger group and maybe do some little mini outings with our, our kids that are in the PGA Learn program. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, okay, and then um, as I mentioned, some of the appreciation days. Um, we want our members, we, we have the slogan, as you know, my club is Deer Path. And we want our members to really do feel like we do appreciate them. We'll be incorporating more kind of um, spontaneous opportunities at the course this summer with some specials for them. Um, we'll have some additional golf shop discount days um, that they can take advantage of. We will have some demo days specific to our members. And then, you know, we'll come up with some other uh, fun like hole contests that just that day you can go in the, when you come into the clubhouse, Rick will have some competition that you can have friendly competition between yourself and maybe another person that's out there and just kind of spice things up a little bit. And so uh, again, last year we was kind of hard to get all of this going at once. We were so new and reinventing a lot of our baseline in situation. This year, I think we can really focus on making the course and the, the amenities and things that we have there really uh, be fun for our, for our members. And so we're, we're, uh, we're hoping to open by April 1st. <laughs> um, that's our goal. Um, and so uh, we still are, right now the, the shop is, the pro shop merchandise is in. We're continuing to add to that, but there's a lot of merchandise in. So it's a great time to come over and check out clubs and check out shoes and get yourself equipped for the year. And Richard's got lessons going, so it's not too late to you know start beginning to, to enjoy the game. And we've got um, a lot of role registration happening for all of the lesson programs is underway as well. So any questions we can answer for you on that? Quick update on the deep well. Uh, nothing to report on the deep well yet. Um, we'll be continuing maybe to investigate that this spring. OK. Thanks, Mary. Now we'll transition to Mary Van Arsdale to give the director's <laughs> report. Again, I know we're, we've been here late, so I don't want to hold everybody too long, but a couple things under my director's report. Let me get my notes out. 
Um, I wanted to mention to you, um, I know I spoke about it briefly with our foundation meeting this month, that we were made aware by the Lake Bluff Park District that they have some challenges with their skate park. Um, it is in deteriorating condition and needs some um, uh, refurbishment in order to keep what's currently there and they have applied for a grant a park grant that they won't know until later in the year whether or not they get that that would possibly allow them to do a much larger uh, scale replacement of their of their uh, their skate park so they've approached us and would um, they're just starting to reach out to interested um, groups that might be able to uh, partner with them to do some basic refurbishment of the skate park. And um, we're still putting some information, I'll have to bring that back to the park board, but I wanted to make you aware of it. Um, just to give you a little bit of, of history on that, um, the skate park was a partnership when it opened um, you know, years back and Croya uh, fundraised and con contributed some money from the city's perspective. Um, they had a family, a prominent family in Lake Bluff who was uh, in memory of their son who had contributed some monies to that. The Lake Bluff Park District did, the village. There was a number of entities that helped make that skate park happen um, when it was first put in. But um, it's, it is a wood structure. Uh, the park district has done every year basic maintenance to it but it's wicking water from the asphalt and it's a wood structure and they've had to, originally it was built without uh, treated lumber. That's part of the problem. <laughs> so they've been replacing the railings and doing some of that structural work, but the actual um, sheet good that sits, that the kids ride, you know, uh, forms the surface for the, the skateboarding itself, uh, a lot of that needs to be replaced. The nails are popping and you know, the boards are coming up and that kind of thing. So I don't know, um, I told them that we would be more than happy to participate in brainstorming and looking at what that options might be. Uh, they don't have a cost at this point in time. But I just want you to be aware of it that it's something that Lake Forest currently residents do youth do go and skate th there and some adults. Croya holds an event there um, each year and so Croya, well they'll be me reaching out to Croya as well to talk with them um, and I mentioned it to our foundation too to um, just begin some dialogue to see the interest in this. Um, <coughs> a very special niche of kids and adults that enjoy the skate park and Quite honestly, I do get asked, and I have been asked since I arrived here, is can we have a skate park in Lake Forest too? And it's nice to be able to say, we, we share it with, you know, there's a facility in Lake Bluff that you can go and enjoy and utilize. And so um, that is nice not to have to invest and duplicate services. So um, the challenge that Lake Bluff Park District has right now is they don't feel that in light of their other priorities and challenges that they have, whether it's their swimming pool or their lakefront or, you know, their golf course um, situation that they have the funds to really completely do it on their own and maintain this facility. So that's where they're going to be reaching out and trying to see what options they have through the two communities to partner with them on this particular item. So any questions I can answer just from the brief history I gave you? There's no decision we need to make relative to no, that No, I'm just, it's just an FYI. I'll bring back more information as the conversation continues. I just thought you might hear about it in the community and I wanted you to have a heads up on that one. Um, the next thing is I wanted to mention about the Emerald Ash Borer. Um, there was an additional presentation made last night to um, City Council as part of the Finance Committee um, budget meeting we had um, where we're trying to lock in, if you will, the um, the, just this next fiscal year's capital costs related to Emerald Ash Borer. And I want to pull my notes out here real quick so I can talk to that point. Um, here it is. Um, and so Bob Kiley uh, did the overall presentation last night. And um, just to give you a good sense is that um, what we've decided to do is step back a little bit on this topic. And uh, we are, we went ahead and by directive of the council last night suggested that instead of 200,000 in the CIP for this upcoming year, they want to see $400,000 put in there so that we have flexibility depending on what strategy and approach we decide to take as we continue our conversation um, this next several months. But um, we want to continue to focus on our resident program and resident education program. We have identified a day of June 1st um, at Gorton Community Center, it's a Saturday um, in the morning. We're going to run an educational workshop on Emerald Ash Borer. So we'll be working or providing you with some information about that. But it's an opportunity where we'd like to give baseline data 
about what's happening in Lake Forest and what this particular um, uh, insect is doing and what you can and can't, shouldn't be considering in your own residential property and what that impact we visualize that's from the public property perspective as well. And then what we'd like to have is a lot of resources available that day so people can go from table to table and ask their questions, pick up information, get some guidance, um, you know, really feel that, you know, they, they can connect with the city staff and other organizations to give them the tools to, you know, look at this, uh, this concern um, in their own homes as well as what's happening in the, in the community. What other organizations will be in attendance, Mary? Um, well, we know that Lake Bluff, the village of Lake Bluff has already expressed interest in partnering with, you know, advertising this and encouraging their residents to attend. Um, I envision that we will have Lake Forest Open Lands. Uh, we'll have uh, some key uh, uh, individuals from the Lake County Forest Preserve District as an example, but so that we can have really uh, a good representation of the kinds of properties in Lake Forest and how they'll be affected and then utilize those those skill sets of all of those organizations to help answer questions at all the various tables. And that's just, a t I'm just saying that we haven't finished who those partner lists would be yet, but we know some of those would be most likely to participate with us. Does it, does it make sense, Mary, to have more than one such day? We, we will look at that if we find that, that you know, that's a need. Um, we've reserved the auditorium at Gordon to do the main presentation so we can seat a lot of people and then the community room so people can flow down there and get information from the tables. There, we can do as many of them as we feel that we need. It's, it's June. You know, it is a little um, hard time of the year because there's a lot of things with wrapping up school and going into summer. But on the other hand, we're trying to put some information out quickly because now you'll begin to see your trees exhibit over the course of the summer. Some of these things that are helpful for you to be able to identify the condition of your tree. And if you're bringing out, you know, an arborist to look at your yard or give you some advice on it, it's a good timing to get some information on everybody's, you know, in their hands. And that's not to say we won't continue to have a variety of resources available on our website, um, whether it's question and answer, you know, FAQ kind of stuff. We're going to, we, we've got a list of recommended arborists and certified arborists in our area, so people have a resource for that. Um, plant list, you know, top recommended trees considered for Lake Forest so that, um, you know, they, they have a frame of reference from which to start, I guess, for their homes. Um, and then also, we, we really need to continue to work on what our city policies, you know, are going to be on this and whether we have to amend our ordinances and what that might look at. So we do have some additional work on that. Um, um, just looking at my notes, uh, Kurt, also Davey, tree experts who helped us with our inventory, has committed to participating with that. And um, Lake Forest College is planning to have people there. Um, let's see, and then, so as part of this, the, the reality is, is that we do know the street tree situation, and you're aware of that, but what's the missing piece is we still need to inventory the remaining parcels that are public properties, whether that's parks, uh, properties that the city facilities sit upon, and wood, wood lots. We have 85 of these kinds of parcels that we're uh, needing to continue the inventory. So that's our goal now is to continue using our crews to go out and finish that inventory um, uh, over the course of the summer so that by the end of the summer we'll have the complete look of public properties and what that would mean. And then from that we're going to craft the bigger picture cost dynamics that we need to take into consideration. But um, it was, um, again, we haven't made any decisions, and that's where the dialogue needs to happen um, con to con continue is, which trees do we want to treat, if any, and for how long, and you know, how, what do we want to replace them with, with what size. I mean, obviously staff have given some thought in order to come up with the initial projections, but that's where we're seeking more feedback and guidance from Park Board and City Council on what that should be. Um, and we want to hear from the public at this June meeting, you know, what is their um, acceptable level? You know, do they have thoughts on how fast they want us to work on this or not? And we don't know if the residents want us to spend money on tr chemical treatments if the trees eventually will come out, because the, or do they want us to because the aesthetic value is worth it to them. So that's what we're going to be trying to get some sense of their thoughts on that. Um, as we've talked about, this is going to change the look of Lake Forest um, over the next 10 years. So it's, it's continuing to be one that we need to invest a lot of time, and we really want to make sure that we spend a lot of thoughtful 
uh, consideration deliberation with this one um, and having said that in order to make sure that we're all staying on the same page with this topic and we're doing this with um, I think important is the Park and Rec Board because many this falls under our department and a lot of these properties are obviously under the jurisdiction and, and oversight of the Park Board. Uh, we want to keep you involved in it, but we also would like to involve us with what's called the Public and Property uh, Properties and Public Lands Commission, which is um, a group of the aldermen who serve on that because again we do have properties that aren't necessarily a park or, you know, an art department, but are public properties, whether that's Gorton or, you know, those kinds of facilities. So that way when we come we come up with these discussions, it's done united and everybody can have the the be at the table to have those conversations. So we will be blending you the two groups together as we move forward. I think I think the city manager has a good strategy with that instead of trying to do it separate and try to have everybody aware of all the questions and you know the dialogue that goes along with that. Um, and then I guess the last thing um, that was shown last night is an example of Harlan Lane in uh, Lake Forest. And as an example, um, it was a picture up there, and I'm sorry I don't have it to, to put up there on the screen for you, but really quickly is, 89% of the trees on Harlan Lane are ash. So if you can imagine if we were to go in and remove their trees, it would be a complete change to the look in their neighborhood. Whereas we gave another example, if you go down Deer Path from um, the Presbyterian Church in Sheridan to Lake Road, in that area, there's just a handful of trees. I think it's 14% of the trees are ash. So a very different situation. So we want to make sure that when we look at whatever strategies that we understand where and how we want to approach our replacements because you can't just say every fifth tree we're going to replace because you may not need it as much on Deer Path as you need it, you know, over on Harlan Lane. And so how we approach and customize it to be sensitive to the neighborhoods and what they'll go through, I think is a very important dialogue that we, we should have. Um, and there might be opportunities, and Bob, Kylie, you know, spoke to this last night was that you know, right now, if you, there's a one home on Deer Path, an example, that has five ash trees, it's their front yard. Of all the trees over there, they're like, she's, that, that home has most of them right in their front yard. And, you know, that resident may say, you know, I know you have, you're going to take them out, but I want to put them back in because they're my only trees. And so do we give opportunities for them to, you know, uh, cost share with us and, and allow that to replace those trees because the resident is interested in participating. So those are all very, that's very fluid here. There's a lot of different moving pieces that are very complex that we need to take into consideration to finalize our EAB plan. Um, and again, staff, we've been up to our eyeballs and working on these things and it's, and but we need to do a better job of helping go through each of these moving dynamic pieces and, and have, um, have some conversation as to you know what what do we want to do with it you know what do we want to replace with what size tree and that kind of thing so so a lot of conversation will continue over the the course of the next several months on that topic so um, let's see I think that's it um, so as I mentioned City Council did uh, d express a desire to increase the funding level for this year um, and uh, that doesn't mean that we will necessarily go out and automatically spend that, but they are looking at us to begin to get some traction this summer to continue to address EAB while we work on the remaining pieces of this. We have the community conversation so that we still have opportunity this fall and winter to utilize whatever funds are necessary um, that they've made available that fits the plan that's finally decided on. So, um, and then I have to just briefly, um, any, I'm sorry, any other questions on EAB or can I answer for you before I move on? Okay. Um, and then the last thing I have here is just some upcoming events. It is spring. And um, first one is our Easter egg hunt and magic show. It's Saturday, March 23rd. It'll be at Deer Path Community Park. Details are up there for you. Um, it's free um, and there's all kinds of fun activities and you must arrive on time or you will miss the egg hunt because it goes like that. So I always encourage parents to, <laughs> this is not a morning to be late, be early. Um, then we have for race for spring, 
which is a program for ages three to six, and um, it's on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday over spring break at their Everett classroom. So enrollment's happening right now. So if you're looking for things for kids to do over spring break at that age, uh, look at that one. And then the Dance Academy also has a spring break workshop um, on Monday, March 25th with some hip hop. And then they have their uh, Dance Me a Story workshop as well. And then um, Wildlife Discovery Center will have some special hours over um, the spring break and their website has their new hours posted by day that will be up there. The Fitness Center has a March fitness special going on right now. You can purchase six sessions of personal training and you'll get one session free. So it's a great deal to get ready for summer. And I already talked about the golf course and um, obviously our camp registration is going on. And then the last one is there is a spring break sports camp for kindergarten through fourth graders as well. So as you can see, the staff really made, um, have really pushed to offer a variety of things for all the different ages over spring break. Um, so those who are in town or you know not heading out of town, there's some things for the kids to do um, through the rec department. So um, I think that's it. Thank you, Mary. Other comments by board members? Opportunities for the public to address the board on items not listed in the agenda. Trish, is your chance. <laughs> huh? I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you.